In the digital age, our systems still perpetuate bias, inequality, and violence in the lives of women and girls. Technological progress is outpacing progress towards gender equality. This is not progress. On this International Women's Day, we make four calls. 1. Remove all barriers to access the digital world. 2. Educate and train women and girls in STEM. 3. Enable women to create tech that meets their needs. 4. Eliminate online gender-based violence. Today we power on to create an equal digital future for all. And welcome to the SDG Roundtable. This month, gender equality champions from around the world are gathering here in New York to attend the 67th session of the Commission on the Status of Women. Coming from governments, the UN, the private sector, NGOs, the media and academia, this year we're talking about innovation and technology for gender equality. It's been less than 100 years since the invention of modern computers, the world has been transformed with the internet, social media, and now generative AI. Gender equality, on the other hand, will take another 300 years, according to UN Women. So the question is, how can we ensure that this rapid technological progress drives SDG 5 forward and not deepen existing inequalities? As the Secretary General has said, the math is simple. Without the insights and creativity of half the world, science and technology will fulfill just half their potential. The UN is determined to scale solutions for global gender equality, both online and offline. My name is Anne Marie, and I'm the executive director of UN Partnerships, and I'll be your moderator. Joining me are four inspiring women leaders. Dr. Abiola Akiyodi Afolabi, Executive Director, Women Advocate Research and Documentation Center, Hoda Osman, Executive Editor at Arab Reporters for Investigative Journalism, welcome. On screen, we've got Valentina Munoz Rabanal, the UN Secretary General's SDG Advocate and Feminist STEM Activist, and Halani Galpaya, Chief Executive Officer of Learn Asia, Welcome and thank you for being with us. Halani, as we're approaching the end of CSW and have learned about the striking discrimination and marginalization of women in technology, 37% of women do not use the internet. In the least developed countries, only 19% of the women are online. What's causing these digital access gaps and how can we ensure meaningful access to technology and digitally empower women and girls. Thank you, Anne-Marie. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, you're absolutely right. The situation has improved with women's access over time, but we have really a long, long way to go. Now, I really wish there was a really cute answer that I can say, you know, let's do X and women will be online. The reason it's a complex um, set of reasons is that because women's digital access lies in a context of low access to a whole lot of other factors. And those factors drive mobile phone ownership, adoption, use, and internet access. So as researchers, we look at this and we, when we look at nationally representative data from Africa, Asia, and Latin America, we see women, are, women who are unconnected are less educated less likely to be working, uh, less likely to be earning a regular income, less likely to earn a high income, and less likely to have, a, um, have digital skills and a whole set of other skills 
live in households with electricity and so on. So these are these compounding factors and all of them really have a significant impact on whether they have mobile access or not, right? So the unpalatable answer, while those are the reasons, so we actually need a cocktail of solutions, right, to improve women's skills. So we, we had this really weird natural experiment during COVID-19. For example, in India, 81 million people came online for the first time, and majority of them came because of COVID-19-induced uh, reasons and majority were women or women headed households because they had to work and needed a phone, wanted to start a business and wanted other income streams because the husband has been laid off or children had to study. So the idea might be to find these discontinuities in women's lives, not COVID hopefully, but something like childbirth, which many women go through and build programs around it that give some meaningful benefit for women owning a phone and find the financing mechanism. So we actually solve some of that access and ownership gap. Thank you, Halani. I'm, I'm hearing about context, that we have to look at the context that women are in, find those milestone moments so that peop, women particularly can engage meaningfully online. And we're gonna turn to that. So building on that, let me turn to you, Abiola. The commission strongly emphasized the importance of education, not only to close digital access gaps, but also to ensure women's participation in decision-making. How can digital technology and education empower and women and girls to gain effective participation in political, economic, social, and civic life? It's a lot to ask for. It is, it is. It's quite a lot to ask. Um, actually, uh, and from what you were saying, education is very critical. Uh, it's critical for empowerment and also is also critical for advancement of uh, digital and you know technological learning, particularly for women. And um, that's why the sustainable development goal is also very clear about the role of education, you know, in terms of being able to achieve the SDG itself. And um, one thing that is also very important is, especially when you're talking about context, when you're thinking about social norms, culture, and how that affects you know, the ability of women to be able uh, to use uh, technology. It's also about the, the school, you know, the climate, the school, the issue of safety, the issue of security of the girl child in school, you know, because we need the school to be safe, you know, for girl child to be able to have that kind of digital learning, you know, that can help them to move from where they are, you know, to 5.0, you know, to be able to be very active, you know, uh, in the society. And where we don't have that, then that becomes a problem. And I think in the global south, that's one of the uh, major challenge that we are having with the with insecurity, uh, with the conflict, you know, uh, for example, in the Sahel, you know, in Nigeria and other places where. Uh, girls are now being discouraged, you know, from you know going to school. So it's important to deal with that, and I and I and that's why I I would commend the UN Democracy Foundation for uh, the work that they're doing with respect to ensuring that they keep you know girls in school and make the school to be safe, you know, and uh, secure. Uh, having said that, so there's also a need to link that, you know, to the whole discussion around the digital divide, uh, where you know uh, there are issues of gender equality. Quality, there are issues of, uh, there are new nuances, you know, that keep, you know, women and girls, you know, out of that knowledge, you know, ability to be able, you know, to acquire the uh, necessary knowledge. Uh, if you look at politics, for example, um, recently I was doing some work uh, in Nigeria. There was an, an election that just finished, and I was talking and training women who are in, into politics. And you find that, that some of them don't even have a space on the internet. Uh, they don't have, apart from Facebook, if you Google their name, you cannot find anything. You know, and these are women who are supposed you know, to take up leadership position. So it becomes very important to make a linkage of this, to be able to expand women's voices, our ability to resources, our ability to be able to fight patriarchy that continue to uh, put women behind. And so putting all this together, innovation is important. It's important to digitalize uh, the table, uh, I mean the decision table, you know, so for women to be able, you know, to participate in the decision table, uh, it's also become very important to be technologically ready, you know, to be part of, you know, making decision on the digitalized table. I love that, the fact that we need the decision, we have to have all the tools to be able to make the best decisions once we're at the table and we need to be at the table. And let's dive into that a little bit deeper. One of the very important sectors is STEM. 
And Valentina, according to UN Women, 75% of jobs in 2050, not that long from now, will be related to STEM. Yet women remain a minority in this area. In the tech industry, men outnumber women two to one. In the field of AI, which you know very much about, only one out of five is a woman. What keeps girls from pursuing STEM careers? How can we overcome these barriers? Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Um, well, for me, everything is about achieving digital rights. The digital gap has a woman's face, material disparities such as the growing poverty gap between men and women are increasingly mirrored in the digital sphere. When we talk about the feminization of poverty, we also need to acknowledge the digital gender gap. Who are the childhoods that lost class the most? The girls, because they have less access to the internet, because they had to take on care, work at home. But it's also different to talk about the digital divide in Europe than here in America Latina. It is crucial that when we talk about the gap, it is through the lens of intersectionality, because the gender digital gap doesn't work the same for a woman. Class, race, age, location, and disability status all have enormous impacts on access to um, in order to increase the number of women in STEM fields, we must first digitize them. It is important that we have equitable, inclusive, and universal access to basic technological tools, such as internet access and an electronic device, and also that bridging the gap is not only providing the tools, but also providing the skills. It is important that we incorporate classes in STEM skills, which are the skills of the 21st century throughout the world. Um, second, we need to establish that digital violence is real violence. So making digital spaces secure, especially for women, I think it's super important. It's urgent also to update our policies regarding harassment and abuse in cyber spaces because opening the digital space and making girls and women unsafe could be even more dangerous than leaving them isolated. I think we need to stop condemning women and girls for not pursuing STEM careers and start questioning what we are doing to make that access safe for them and for all of the people. Thank you, Valentina. And, and let me take um, that idea of keeping women safe. Technology is facilitating new forms of gender violence and harmful narratives which undermine women online. Hoda, this is something that you've been really thinking about, and it's, it, it can lead to self-censoring and a general reduction of interaction in digital spaces. It can also limit women's participation in public life, considering how increasingly interchangeable digital and physical spaces are becoming. How can this be prevented? How can women and girls' rights be protected in digital spaces? I want to start by saying I really appreciate what you said about we're talking about improving access to the digital space and to cell phones, but is this space safe or isn't it, or it's not? There was a very important study that was done by the International Center for Journalists with the support of UNESCO uh, about women journalists' online safety. And 73% of the uh, women said that they had experienced online violence uh, throughout their work. So we have to be very careful with this. Uh, at uh, Arab Reporters for Investigative Journalism is where I work, and I will just want to give you a quick idea of what we do. We support investigative journalists working on investigations in Arab countries, many of whom, of course, are females, as well as uh, different initiatives, initiatives uh, uh, some focused on women, including one that is called I Will Not Stay Silent, and it's about uh, harassment in the workspace and how to empower women and create a, a, um, an environment where they're able to file complaints and know their rights, et cetera, et cetera. 
Also, we have another uh, project uh, funded by the UN uh, Democracy Fund, where two thirds of the uh, participants were women, and it's called in Arabic "Men al Masul," which means "Who is responsible?" and it's about accountability. To get back to your question, I do not think, sadly, that we can prevent it, but there's a lot that we can do to improve the situation, to make the space more safe uh, for women, and uh, therefore allow them to participate you know, more freely. Journalism was already ex exceptionally challenging for women, especially Arab uh, journalists, and now with the digital component, you know, it has become even more uh, challenging. So some of the things that we can do, one is to continue doing our job as journalists, to continue, actually Maria Ressa, the, of course, you know, renowned the Filipino-American uh, investigative journalist who was also a Nobel Peace Prize uh, laureate, she said she was the uh, a subject of a lot of online attacks and she said, our only defense as journalists is to continue doing our work and to continue shining the light. So one thing is to continue doing our work. The second is to raise awareness about sometimes even online harassment is considered by the women who are experiencing the harassment. They don't recognize that this is harassment because the bar is so high. So raising awareness about what is online violence and online harassment, how to deal with it, uh, what you can do. And we can't do this alone. Men have to be part of the solution too, so we work on uh, training uh, women as well as training the men too. In this project that we did, it's, uh, I will not stay silent, we had 12 webinars where there was participation with lots of speakers, you know, to talk about the different uh, subjects. And we also have to be creative in terms of who, there's a lot of misinformation out there, how do we present this? We can, we can do our work, we can publish it in the traditional, you know, newspapers, who's going to read it? <laughs> so we have, to be, we have to see where are people getting their information uh, and use all these new tools. Last thing I want to mention is that there are incredible, uh, at least in my field in journalism, there are so many incredibly talented and skilled uh, journalists. We have a six months uh, data journalism diploma. It's very demanding, it requires analyzing databases. So many of the participants are young female journalists who you know, learn very quickly, know how to use it, and publish amazing investigations. Thank you so much, Hoda. And this has been such an interesting conversation. For International Women's Day, I had a chance to sit down with the UN Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed, and we discussed the intersection between technology, gender equality, and the sustainable development goals. Let's take a look. Today we're talking a lot about technology and how technology can support women and girls in their vital roles as agents of change for sustainable development and peaceful and inclusive societies. It's a big mouthful. What does that mean for you? Well, break it down first of all for women and girls to have access to the technology. So it's really important uh, whether you're talking about foundational learning or skills that are needed to connect you uh, to the workplace and to anything else, you've got to have the knowledge. And so that's really important. It's important for me uh, when I hear that to say this is what's going to connect networks. Um, as an activist, it's really important that I can reach out to different constituencies and wow, does technology help you do this? Um, technology is just opening up so much. We've, we're hearing a lot about AI. We're, we're hearing about innovations every day, these different breakthroughs. What are the breakthroughs that you're looking for to help the, us deliver and keep the promise on the SDGs? Well, SDGs, I mean, the main ask of that in delivering the promise is access, whether it is to education, to healthcare, to jobs, um, to your role in, in climate uh, change um, and, and being an advocate for that. Uh, technology connects you to that and brings the information, uh, allows you to use it to, to advocate, allows you to use it uh, to frame policy um, and perhaps do a lot of the research and analysis that is needed um, to get out there and to do more. Uh, so I, I see that in all those sectors that we can connect. Um, it is going to be incredibly important, as I saw the other day in Niger, when a whole lot of young women uh, were taught robotics, they were taught the different use of technologies. One that impressed me most of all was when one lady was saying, if I put this probe into this so soil, I don't have to wait until the fungus has already got my crop. I will be able to tell, you know, three months before. Um, and, you know, she was just thrilled with that. And suddenly, 
um, being in the food systems, producing food, uh, became much more exciting for a young person. It wasn't about getting into the field with a hoe. It was really about using technology to give you a job with dignity. Um, and for young people, that's really important. Another aspect of it is connecting women um, to financial services. This is so important for their independence. Um, it's also important when you see uh, what you need to do, again, I'll use the food systems, from production to market, um, and enable women do that with ha without having to move out of their community, um, out of that society where they're an uh, instrumental part of the leadership and, and social cohesion. So it's, it's, it's got, you know, I think what it portends for women is huge. We have to understand it better. Um, and we have to make sure that we've got all the infrastructure uh, in place uh, so that we don't leave women behind. But I'm very excited about the potentials of what we can do with technology and with women in leadership. Leaving no women behind. I saw a lot of nodding as we were talking as, as the DSG was um, sharing her thoughts and insights. Any reactions? I, I, I quite agree with her on the issue of um, social inclusion, technology goes that far. You know, helps in terms of information, what you need to be able to network, to be able to connect. And talking about connecting and networking, even, you know, sexual and gender-based violence reduced, you know, with the advancement of technology. You know, you know, you have the information, you know who to call, you know what app to use, you know how to get yourself out of trouble, you know, and, and all of that. So uh, that, that's a way to go. And I think it's going to help in terms of, you know, liberating a lot of, um, issues around gender equality. Can I say something? <laughs> Please, yes. Yes. Well, um, Mrs. Amina shows that she's very clear about the intersectionality of the digital gender gap, and I love that. Uh, when we talk about territoriality, we are not only talking about the place where the gap is located, but about everything that involves living in that space. We are talking about the shared history of the people who inhabit it, their culture, their religious beliefs, their public policy, their supply systems, their relationship with nature. Um, inter internet access is urgent for everyone, but it's also different in each part of the world, which is why it is essential to have the ability to understand the impact that digital rights will have in each space from its innate diversity. We must be respectful and empathetic, which lately is rare when we talk about science and technology, especially with the globalization of initiatives in this regard. But we must constantly remind ourselves that technology is born from people, from their problems and what we are willing to do to solve them together. I love that, solving, solution, solving problems together with solutions. Halani, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, I think a quick one, tying in what Valentina was saying and um, this uh, Aunt Secretary was saying. I think, you know, we need to think of women as such a useful, not just economic contributor, but as a market contributor, right? And, and solutions have to take into account the needs and context. So, you know, Amina mentioned mobile money, right? In the early surveys, women would always say, oh, how useful is this mobile money solution, let's say in some Africa, East African country, and they would always rank it a lot less useful than the men ranked it, right? And you're like, why? And they use it less. And then you realize the structure, the design of that money transfer service is that women who are on irregular income are more likely to pay smaller transaction, you know, smaller transactions and transfers, pay a disproportionately high fees compared to men who on average make higher transfers, right? So that is a market need that is so useful to fill by a third party provider. So we need to shine the light on sort of these kinds of unmet needs, which are really viable to serve. And I just want to come back to men and women who also keep women down online, harass them and so on. I think we spend a lot of time talking about how women should be safer and make themselves more empowered. I think that's absolutely important. But recognize that that conversation very easily can turn into, oh, so keep women offline. That's the safest place to go. It's not. I think we need to talk as much about the perpetrators of online violence as much as we talk about the victims. We need to count them, shine the light on them. Thank you, Alani. Do you want to come in, Hoda? 
I, I agree with everything that everybody said. And I, I, I was in Morocco recently giving a workshop on uh, how to cover uh, violence against women. And in the room, there were men and women. And I have to say that it is really uh, inspiring and you know, satisfying to see the uh, you know, men journalists also participating and asking good questions and willing to change the way that they've been writing about this. So yeah, absolutely, you know, men should definitely be part of it. So we need everyone. Yeah. We need innovation. Mm -hmm. We have many problems in the world that are looking for solutions. And I think everyone here has really contributed to explaining some of what's holding us back and also some of those opportunities that are going to open doors for us to use that innovation for women, for equality. Uh, I, before we close the panel, I just want to ask each of you and invite you to share one word that's capturing how you feel so far at CSW. So, Halani? We need to fast track this. Aviola? Women can't wait. Oh, like that. Valentina? Steminism. It's the intersectionality <laughs> between a STEM and feminism. It's the future. It's a great word. Hoda? One word that describes how I feel is supported. Being here with you and knowing that each one of us is working on, you know, their own angle or whatever the work, I feel very supported and I feel like, you know, we can do a lot. And I'm feeling about the importance of leveraging lived experience. Um, everything you've talked about is, it has to be tailored to the women, um, to the communities that we live in. And thank you again for each of you and for contributing and for being with us. And you can find out more about the Commission on the Status of Women by clicking on the link below. And again, a huge thank you to everyone here. And we look forward to seeing you next time.